Hey guys, welcome back to episode number 22 of the Wash U Nephrology Renal Pass Series. I'm going to give a brief talk on multiple myeloma and specific cast nephropathy. I'm going to upload this video a little bit earlier before uh, the month of November since I will be gone at Kidney Week and I hope to see many of you there. So I'm going to just start with a case presentation. Um, this is a case that I saw in clinic several years ago um, and I still follow. She's a 77 year old Caucasian female. She has a past medical history of high uh, cholesterol and she was just noted uh, on routine blood work to have a creatinine up to 1.8 a year ago it was 0 0.8 and this was checked by her primary care physician. All that was done at that point was she was encouraged to drink more fluids and they reassessed the renal function a month later and at that point it had gone all the way up to 2.8 uh, which is when she was referred to me for further evaluation. Otherwise she was asymptomatic. Her only medication she was on Lipitor and aspirin and on exam she had a relatively normal blood pressure for her age uh, and looked very well, um, appeared much younger than her stated age, was comfortable, had no complaints, and had a normal physical exam. I'm going to show you the blood work. Uh, her sodium was 138, potassium 52, bicarbonate 21, BUN 42, and creatinine of 2.8. Her calcium was 11.6, hemoglobin of 10.5. Her urine showed trace protein protein, trace blood, and no glucose. Her urine sediment showed no casts, and her urine protein to creatinine ratio was 10.5 grams per gram. She had a normal kidney ultrasound. So the question I think I have for the viewers is um, what would you do at this point? I already kind of prefaced this whole talk by saying we're going to discuss multiple myeloma. But look back at her labs and see if you can notice some of the red flags that are jumping out at you that would make you consider a disease like a monoclonal gammopathy in this type of patient. So obviously the renal failure, which is uh, pretty profound and going up quickly, elevated calcium and anemia, those are red flags. Her age group, she's 77, she's the right age group to have myeloma. And also this big discrepancy between the trace protein on the UA but the nephrotic range um, uh, quantification. So this 10 and a half grams of protein that was detected on the ratio is related to overflow proteinuria from production of those light chains, not albuminuria. And remember that the urinalysis only detects negatively charged proteins and positively charged proteins as would be seen in myeloma, like light chains, would not be detected on the UA. Thus you have this big discrepancy. So all things in this case really scream that she might um, be, uh, um, might have a diagnosis of myeloma. This is the testing that we did at that time. Uh, started with a serum immunofixation, which showed an IgG lambda monoclonal protein. Um, this was also detected in the urine. And now we can do a test called serum free light chains where you can actually quantify the lambda and the kappa. So this in and of itself uh, doesn't tell you if it's a monoclonal protein, but it can really help you detect if there is a monoclonal gammopathy as would be seen in this testing where you have a very elevated lambda but a normal kappa and the ratio of almost z of zero essentially uh, is consistent with a lambda uh, myeloma. So when this patient saw me in clinic, uh, we stopped her aspirin, we um, admitted her for a kidney biopsy. The kidney biopsy, I'm going to show you some more pictures later on. Uh, sh this is a, uh, a, a, a slide looking at this cast that's within the tubule. And we're going to teach you hopefully in this episode how to differentiate this type of cast from hyaline casts or RBC casts or other things that you would see. So uh, she also had a bone marrow biopsy done, which did show 60% plasma cells and lambda light chain restricted. So she did have officially the diagnosis of multiple myeloma. She got treated with dexamethasone and Velcade. And uh, at this time, we actually also performed plasma uh, phoresis. We're gonna discuss some of the data behind that. She did very well, actually, tolerated the chemo, tolerated uh, the plasma exchange, never needed dialysis, was uh, out of the hospital within a week and completed four total cycles of chemo. Here's her trend in her renal function. Her creatinine was 2.8 when she saw me when we brought her back into the hospital. It was actually elevated to three, three and a half, at which point we did the 
uh, kidney biopsy, bone marrow biopsy, initiated prompt chemotherapy, and you can see uh, almost uh, an immediate reduction in her creatinine. Uh, didn't go all the way back down to normal, but she did stabilize with the creatinine uh, in the 1.5 to 2 range, which all things considered is pretty good. Uh, and you can also see her response to the chemo uh, and potentially the plasma exchange, but probably more the chemo uh, within um, 26 days from initiation, her lambda had gone from over a thousand down to seven and she remains in remission, fortunately. So I wanna start first by talking about the uh, pathophysiology of uh, these casts. So these uh, proteins, these light chain proteins, in this case it was a lambda, are, are filtered at the glomerulus and will enter the tubular filtrate. And so these are uh, signified by these uh, red dots here. Um, as it passes through the tubule, it can actually affect the kidney in multiple places. Um, it can deposit within the glomerulus or the tubules and lead to something called light chain deposition disease. It can get um, um, endocytosed and folded into beta pleated sheets where it can deposit as amyloidosis. It can actually be reabsorbed within the proximal tubule where it can cause a proximal RTA and Fanconi's like syndrome. But for the case of cast nephropathy, what happens is it actually passes all the way into the distal tubule. And here it complexes with uh, uromodulin, which is essentially uh, TAM horse fall protein. That's the other name for it is uromodulin. Um, and it's the component of hyaline casts. So you can see here a hyaline cast forming, which is not pathognomic for a glomerular disease or tubular disease that can be seen in um, normal uh, individuals as well. But in this case, that hyaline cast also has some unbound uh, trapped light chains within it. And so that is what actually causes the cast. It's a combination of the filtered light chains along with uromodulin create, um, creating these uh, casts. What also happens here is you have you, you can have rupture of the tubular basement membrane and leakage of contents out into the interstitium. And what can occur at the, as a result of that is you have an inflammatory cell infiltrate coming from the interstitium into the tubules and you can actually see giant cells and other uh, inflammatory cells adherent to those casts. And that's another one of these clues that we're dealing with something like cast nephropathy rather than um, another uh, type of uh, urine cast that you would see. So here's a picture. This is a lovely picture taken from the um, Atlas of Renal Pathology, which is available on AJKD online. Uh, the source is down here. It's also available in print. So here we have a, a PAS stain of a um, uh, myeloma cast. The, the other name for cast nephropathy it used to be called myeloma kidney, but uh, we know that myeloma can actually affect the kidney in many ways. So cast nephropathy is kind of what we are now calling this. So this is um, one of these myeloma casts, and you can see it has almost like a glassy appearance to it. Uh, it's a little different than a hyaline cast. You can also see some of these inflammatory cells adherent to it. And in, in this cast, for example, you can see it is fractured in many different places. So whenever you, you hear some of those buzzwords like fractured or glassy or inflammatory cell infiltrate along with casts, it should at least raise your antenna and make you think about myeloma cast nephropathy. Here's another picture, uh, again taken from the similar um, atlas, higher power view. This is a silver stain, and again you can see kind of this swirly glass appearance. You can see that it's broken in many places, almost like it's, uh, the, the, the pathologist who told me first about it where it made sense. It's almost like a piece of glass and you just gently hit it with a hammer so that it cracks in multiple places. And you can see several of these cracks and you can also see these inflammatory cells adherent to it. Again, that's a result of uh, rupture into the interstitium and an inflammatory cell infiltrate adherent to these casts. The best way and the most definitive way to prove that you're dealing with cast nephropathy is to do immunofluorescence and it should have light chain restriction to whatever the monoclonal protein is. So in this case we had a lambda uh, monoclonal protein and so if you did lambda ch uh, staining uh, these casts would 
be bright green. And if you did kappa, of which this patient did not have a kappa paraprotein, it would be negative. You're not always so lucky to get a lovely electron microscopy image uh, of myeloma cast nephropathy, but if you do get a high power view, I think this really demonstrates nicely how these casts would look. And again, I think that analogy of uh, a plate of glass just gently struck with a hammer, you can see how it has just fractured in many different places. This is a, a great picture, which was uh, from a C. Jason article, and I've provided the link there. So the big question and the, th the thing that we've been talking about at least for 10, 15 years or so is when you have these casts, uh, should you do plasma exchange or some kind of high cutoff dialysis? They also call it protein leaking dialysis where you can actually remove light chains. So the hypothesis obviously is that these casts are, are made up of circulating light chains. And if you remove those circulating light chains, you would prevent further kidney injury. And because the size of kappa and lambda light chains are kind of in this middle molecule range, they're 20 to 40 kilodaltons, not as big as albumin, not as small as something like BUN, um, they could be removed with um, uh, dialysis, but more efficiently removed with plasma exchange or high cutoff dialysis. This has been hypothesized even as early as the late 80s when there was actually the first uh, I, I guess you can call it randomized controlled trial, um, looking at plasma exchange in multiple myeloma. This was a very small study. I think they only included about 15 patients, but it kind of started the trend of um, considering plasma exchange. And there were several more randomized controlled trials throughout the years, which were all marred by um, uh, difficult inclusion criteria, or they didn't biopsy the patients to prove it was cast nephropathy, or they didn't measure free light chains, or whatever. Uh, complicated by all of that, chemotherapy has gotten a lot better over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, and so um, the most recent trials I'm going to talk about uh, are going to be called the Meyer study, and the next slide will be the u -Lite. So Meyer, multiple myeloma and renal failure due to myeloma cast nephropathy. Here's the source if you would like to look at the original journal. This was a prospective randomized controlled trial, only 98 patients. Uh, so it remains pretty small, uh, but it had very strict inclusion. You had to have myeloma, AKI, dialysis requirement, and biopsy proven cast nephropathy. And both arms received bortezomib uh, based chemotherapy. And so you were randomized to conventional high flux dialysis versus a high cutoff dialys dialysis, which could more efficiently remove light chains. Both patients in both groups needed dialysis that was part of the inclusion. And the primary endpoint in this uh, trial was uh, renal recovery off of dialysis at three months. And unfortunately, there was no change in the primary endpoint in both groups at three months. But if you looked further out uh, at six months, the high cutoff group um, had, uh, had improved renal recovery. 61% in, in those receiving high cutoff versus only 37.5% in those receiving conventional dialysis. One of the big uh, criticisms of this is that they didn't really go into uh, detail about the degree of light chain reduction. In the u light trial, which was uh, done in the um, UK, um, very similar inclusion criteria. The dialyzers were a little bit different and they were actually much more aggressive. Um, instead of uh, doing three times a week, they did eight uh, out of 10 days, uh, eight out of the first 10 days and eight hour sessions. And again, looked at similar um, outcomes, no difference in renal recovery at three months, 55 versus 51%. Interestingly, there was also no difference in light chain reduction outcomes, no GFR difference at two years, and unfortunately more infections were seen in the high cutoff group. So if you look at a slide kind of summarizing the two, very similar numbers, we're only dealing with about 100 patients, virtually the same study population, uh, new myeloma, biopsy confirmed cast nephropathy and needed dialysis. Chemo was similar. Uh, the treatments were a little bit different. U-Light used two dialyzers in series, and the Meyer used a single, uh, uh, single uh, um, dialyzer. Uh, 
um, similar primary outcome, similar secondary outcome. The big difference here was dialysis independence at six months in the Meyer group was higher in those receiving uh, uh, high cutoff or plasma exchange. So it's tough because uh, these trials uh, came to somewhat different conclusions, but both had a negative primary outcome. And I think we were all really hoping that plasma exchange would make a huge difference, uh, and that didn't seem to be the case. Uh, nonetheless, I think the takeaway points from this brief presentation is that you, you really, as a nephrologist, have to think about multiple myeloma in the right setting. Again, in this patient, uh, she was the right age group. She had uh, renal failure. Um, we see a lot of renal failure, but you know, in older patients, we should consider um, monoclonal uh, gammopathies. She had this high calcium, this low hemoglobin, and again, the big red flag was a discrepancy in the urinalysis and the proteinuria uh, that was quantified. You should biopsy these patients if you uh, are considering a uh, intervention like cast nephropathy and when you do biopsy cast nephropathy what you should see again fractured glassy casts sometimes you'll see multinucleated giant cells and on immunofluorescence you'll have light chain restriction to the protein the other big takeaway is that you got to reduce the light chains via chemotherapy right away you're not going to achieve adequate removal of light chains with plasma exchange alone and certainly even if you do consider doing plasma exchange it shouldn't delay your initiation of chemotherapy because really reducing um, the light chain production by giving upfront chemotherapy is is far and away more important than doing any kind of plasma exchange. And obviously we looked at these trials, there's still a lot of controversy, um, and I think uh, it needs to be individualized to the patient based on um, their characteristics. So that's the uh, short takeaway on cast nephropathy. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope to see many of you at Kidney Week. You guys know where to follow me. If you have suggestions for what you'd like to hear more, definitely shoot me an email, yaott at wusel.edu. Follow our channel on YouTube. Follow me on Twitter at maximal underscore change. Thanks again for watching.